Hello, everyone, and welcome to the lecture two of this course, Pintronics Advanced Materials. So this lecture will be structured somewhat different with respect to the first lecture. And the main difference is that we already learned a lot of basics and uh, very important information about magnetic materials and um, physics behind therefore all that information will be used intensively now to go further to go to more advanced field of science and to see what kind of uh, new phenomena we can get and what kind of new types of structures and materials we can have and how we can use them in our uh, everyday life for example so today again we are speaking about motivation uh, so here it will go slightly different spintronics against electronics and uh, i should remind you that in that very first lecture on uh, magnetic advanced materials there was a long video promotional video for magnetism and it was in reality promotional video also for spintronics so already there we have seen why magnetism is important why spintronics is important and afterwards we will switch to uh the second part which is more or less our <laughs> lecture and you see that here i mix already physics and application the point is that uh, fundamental physics we know already and now step by step we will be uh, discussing some physical phenomena and immediately in the same lecture we will be speaking about how it can be used for some devices so let us briefly go through we will start with again with refresh our memories about conductivity because uh, spintronics operates with spin polarized electric currents and we will just refresh basics uh, our knowledge about what is normal electric conductivity is through the model the reference model so on then we will switch to two spin channel models so this is such a approach which is intensively used in spintronics and helps in understanding most of the phenomena which we see then we will switch to half metals for example hoisin materials is half metal will be briefly discussed here then such interesting phenomena as spin injection spin accumulation and afterwards we come into nowadays there is a huge family of hall effects so we all know hall effects um, when we send current through a conductor and due to Lorentz force we will get accumulation of charge in transverse direction but nowadays we also have anomalous hall effect spin hall effect inverse spin hall effect and so on the lecture 2.7 will be devoted to such phenomena as spin transit torque and to the phenomena inverted to it in named spin pumping then there will be a small but very interesting part devoted to spin color electronics spin Peltier effect and spin Zeebeck effect and then there will be a large part about magneto resistance so this is something which we really use in everyday life and among others there will be anomalous magneto resistance giant magneto resistance tunnel magneto resistance and we'll close the lecture with uh, semiconductors so we know that nowadays uh, semiconductor technique is mainly used in our devices in our smartphones and uh, semiconductor spintronic is also de uh, developed so this part will be given by dr levchenko and will be devoted to the overlap between semiconductor physics and spintronics okay and today spintronics versus electronics now we want to speak a bit why spintronics is of interest and if you will go to any conference to most of modern conferences and especially in the field of spintronics which refers to spin electronic you will see many talks which start with the story that cmos which stays for complementary metal oxide semiconductor structure so it's semiconductor technology which is used nowadays in smartphones and everywhere in all computers that it is coming to the end and nevertheless the deeper i'm getting in the topic uh, the less critics i am tell and <laughs> trying to tell about simos uh, because it's really developing 
amazingly and developing fast. For example, I heard the story from a colleague of mine who is more experienced, who teached something about semiconductor physics and technology 20 or 30 years ago. He had in his mind, had uh, kind of some of the integrated circuits and said that you see here, he read it in some book, uh, this device here, they reach already the fundamental limitations and it will not become better because it was so good already compared to vacuum technique and so on. And since that time, uh, CMOS uh, semiconductor technology at least decreased a few orders of magnitude and uh, orders of magnitude in energy consumption and so on. So it's evolving very fast. People always speaking about fundamental limitations, but be careful that uh, most likely there will be new technological decision uh, solutions which make uh, CMOS better and better. And I would not, uh, I believe that still it will be at least for the next 50 or 100 years the most, uh, the dominant technology. Um, so before we will speak about Spintronics, which gives you added value on top of electronics, uh, let us towards say about what is going on now with electronics. So here you see the line um, from about the evolution of um, technology over the last uh, around 20 years. And you see that in 2003, there was future size of semiconductor transistor was 90 uh, nanometers. So here it's a silicon chip. So silicon is very important because it's um, re relatively, so it's cheaper than other materials for fabrication. That's why it's in use. Then here were uh, gate and, and uh, yeah, source and drain were made of silicon germanium. Germanium has a higher mob mobility and allows you to decrease uh, energy consumption of this device. And here there is a gate region. So you control, there will be current from source to gate only when you apply voltage to the gate. And this is some uh, standard field effect transistor planner. Then there was some trick in order. So they have problems that, uh, for example, when you do not apply voltage, you want to have zero uh, tra uh, transmission of signals, so zero conductivity, the transistor should be closed. In reality, they usually have some parasitic uh, flow of electrons and therefore they are fighting, the, it limits the applicability of the device and it uh, also increases the energy consumption. Therefore, to fight with this and other problems, they have used some technology of strain silicon. This is just example for you, how it develops. That there are always some solution, maybe sometimes very unexpected. So they created some atomic strain in the silicon to, uh, to improve, I think, leakage primarily. Then they used the high K metal gate. High K means uh, material, so here it was deposited, materials with high dielectric constant epsilon. Um, and epsilon, it's a uh, square root of epsilon, it's refractive index N, as you know. And um, what it does, it kind of sucks in, so it uh, attracts uh, electric field uh, lines, so electric field, and then increases concentration, and it helps them to. Uh, improve uh, the uh, leakage in particular. So then there was some second generation and then they switched to so-called fin. Fin because of like in fish, there is this fin part of a fish. And uh, what does it mean? It means that they took this gate region, they started to make them vertical. And you see it happened relatively, so 10 years ago. And uh, when they started to make them vertical, they increased here uh, area between the gate contact and this um, uh, semiconductor. And uh, in such a way, and you see it also helps them to decrease sizes. So we are staying now already at 20 nanometer. And then there is, they started to put several of them. So, so second generation and third generation with some another patterning there will be something else. So the message here is that you see how small they are, already 10 nanometer. Therefore, I would say that the real fundamental limitation of CMOS is the lattice constant of silicon, which is an atomic range. And before they will continue searching for new advanced methods and will be making our computers better and better. 
there's no doubts. And here's again the evolution of FinFET. Uh, then there is this GAA structure which stays for gate all around. So it means that after they have this FET, the fins, they start to make them, them in nanorods. So instead of having in such planes, they start to make nanorods. And then there are even more complex structures. We will see some movie to get you a feeling what is this. So what matters on this is the process of the development. First of all, losses in on state. So it means that when you uh, create here, put here voltage, you want to open transistor, you make it on, but you don't want to spend energy for this. And that's the reason why uh, in the first uh, field effect transistors, you really send currents through gate to ground and it costs you energy. Then at some point uh, it was found that you don't need to send current, it's sufficient to apply electric field. And that's how letter O appeared in CMOS, uh, complementary metal oxide semiconductors, because they placed this oxide layer and then they switch on and off this transistor with electric field. Uh, the only what you have to keep in mind that it works in some sense like capacitor. For DC, capacitor, it's, uh, uh, it's kind of cut at wire, so you do not pass DC through capacitor. But if you will send AC, alternative current, then it works as, um, yeah, it's shortcut for a microwave signal at high frequencies. The same here. So if you want to keep energy in on state, it doesn't cost you energy. It shouldn't cost you energy. There is some leakage and this is what stays here, losses in on state. Uh, but uh, when you work process data at three gigahertz clock rate of our computer, yeah, then you still switch it on and off and you create alternative and you will cost, uh, spend some energy. That's why CMOS is still, it's really small energy consumption, but it's still not ideal because you still have dual heating because of alternative signal. Heat dissipation. Most of these devices, which we use nowadays, they can work at tens of gigahertz, 20 or 40 gigahertz frequencies. But as you know, the clock rate of your computer is stuck at three gigahertz. I still remember times when the speed rate of uh, clock rate of computers was doubled every year. So my first uh, computer was, had 450 megahertz uh, processor. And then in, it was one gigahertz, one and a half, two gigahertz and so on. And uh, why they don't use this so high speed? Simply because of joule heat. When you increase uh, speed, then you have to uh, you send this alternative signal and you increase parasitic joule heat. And at some point, it's simply too expensive energetically to get this heat out of the system. Therefore, what they did, they stuck at uh, three gigahertz. They didn't move for more than probably already 15 years. They do not increase uh, clock rate, although they can. But instead, they are putting more cores in the processor or searching for other ways to increase the power of the processor. So max switching frequencies, that's what we discussed. Die size, it's a, each wafer is cut it into dice and you want to keep this one uh, chip as small as possible. Packaging size, so all other materials, so you want to have it as small as possible, as fast as possible and can use as less energy as possible. So this is easy for each technology. I'm sorry, so what you... Yes? Uh, yeah, on the previous slide, uh, first uh, two families, yeah, uh, 1955. Uh, you already mentioned that uh, to enhance the mobility and resistive performance and generally deal with the problem of mobility degradation in biological vertical electric field, they use the silicon germanium. It's true, mm -hmm. they are still using. Also, as you see, they are strained. Uh, films. It means that it's the same way to deal with uh, uh, mobility degradation as adding germanium. So they were working with this problem from two sides. First, adding germanium with a concentration uh, of germanium twenty percent. It depends on p type or n type. Usually, no more than twenty. And secondly, by uh, physically stretching or compressing the silicon crystal using mm -hmm. various means. Yeah, and this all just one fact. Okay. Second. And yeah, a number of things in FinFET is also, I mean, there's a complex 
it's not random. Uh, I think there was a complex calculation of uh, widths, the height of the fins, uh, uh, distance between them. It was all included to be the most optimal one. And generally, you can work um, with a drive car and strength uh, by increasing height, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. So, uh, put in addition to the information, and uh, it's good. And uh, now we are just uh, last two words about what will be the future. So, first of all, you see this uh, uh, size here, it's a nanometer, the size of the element. So, now I think Intel already reported for seven nanometer, or maybe IMD, or maybe both. Uh, so, we are staying currently here. By the way, keep in mind, I've been in the factory in China, which produces these um, processors, and uh, they, I was in, impressed that in reality, most of the uh, processors they're producing is not, I think they don't have this technology, they have maybe 20 something, the smallest, but um, most of the, everything that they produce is the size is 124, I think, or something, nanometers, so much larger. Because in reality, not everybody needs such a very, very small uh, nodes. And uh, they really use this super new, super expensive processors only for smartphones and maybe for some fancy laptops. Most of the CMOS technology uses larger nodes since it's much cheaper and you don't need so much power, let's say. But the message here is that you see this is where we are currently staying and they are talking already intensively about five and three nanometers. So they are good. And which direction they, they considered, it's not clear now. There are at least three ways which they are considered. First of all, it's a switch from feet, thin fat to gate all around when you have like this. Second is when you replace uh, silicon with uh, three five, uh, so it's like valence in the table of elements. Three five uh, semiconductors like gallium arsenide or gallium indium arsenide, I think, is studied in IMAC in Belgium. And the third direction that they go simply insert in 3D. So instead of making in plane structures, they hope build vertical fat, then they can make pack the uh, devices even more dense. And now we will listen even about a new way from um, Samsung. So they will briefly explain once more that what I just said, and they will show kind of a next step how they see it. So be ready, it might be loud. Whenever semiconductor technology faced challenges, there has been a guiding light to help navigate the maze. Evolution of transistors is a major component of technology development. Planar transistors have been used for generations with voltage scaling to save power. However, short channel effect ultimately limited usability. FinFETs were the solution and made further voltage scaling possible. Unfortunately, limitations are faced again. For ideal electrostatics, the channel needs to be fully surrounded by the gate. This is known as gate all around. Typical GAAs are nanowires. However, integration complexities of nanowires outweigh the benefits. This led Samsung Foundry to create a unique version of GAA with all the advantages but minimal complications. Samsung Foundry proudly introduces our multi-bridge channel FETs. MBC FETs consist of multi-stacked nanosheets. One advantage of MBC FETs is that additional area is not required to improve speed. Fin FETs need fins to be laterally added, while nanosheets can be vertically stacked. MBC FETs are compatible with Fin FET designs. Designers can replace fin fets with MBC fets without changing the footprint. Performance can also be improved without area increase. MBC fets are the most advanced technology that provides solutions from low power to high performance applications, including AI, autonomous driving, 5G, and high performance computing. With MBC fets, Samsung Foundry 
will be the guiding light for the future of the semiconductor industry. Samsung Foundry. No, so it was a long story about how good electronics is, and it's good that we understand now what kind of problems do they have, because it cannot be all perfect. That's what we exp uh, discussed. So you need to go to extreme ultraviolet if you want to have seven or five nanometer or beyond uh, three nanometer next even some next generation of extreme ultraviolet technology uh, called high numerical aperture. aperture. So some other technological approaches to solve the problem. Um, yeah, so they need selective processes. It means that when you work with different materials, you need to have different uh, deposition and edge technologies. Depending on material, it will be different. So it's all getting very complicated. Uh, they, uh, they, are, they have problems with interconnect. So all these schemes, they are full of different wires. So you need to put all this billion or million of your elements and then you need to connect them properly. You need to take into account about delay, uh, delay of uh, signals. You have to take into account capacities which exist there. So it's a separate galaxy. So huge uh, field of science where all this is studied. And uh, then power consumption, of course, the more elements you pack into the uh, more energy it will cost and drill heat, you need to find a way how to get it out. and at the end of the day, it brings us to money. So this is probably the limiting factor nowadays. And um, if you will see the advanced design cost uh, as a function of size of the element, you see the, how it was uh, evolving. And now we, they need to make a jump from 10 nanometer, you see, to uh, 5 nanometer. There is a huge jump in money. So in simple words, it is possible to make it smaller, but it's getting expensive, very expensive. And uh, a good friend of mine from iMac, he said that principally they can do it so small, but it's coming to the state when it's more like a piece of art. So you need, really need, of course, you need reliable technology, which just gives you billions of the same devices, but it's now really hard to do it like this. Uh, each sample might have slightly different properties. You need to have a person who knows who calibrated all the parameters and can reproduce and so on and so on. So it's all getting very expensive, very unstable. And this is a limiting factor. You all know this famous Moore law. Uh, so Moore is the um, founder of Intel. And at some point he said that uh, the number of transistors per integrated circuit will double every two years. And uh, it's not physical. Uh, low, it's uh, uh, economical also, it's about money. They just have found the ways that in order to get maximum profit, as an evolution, they need to have it not fast and not slow. And then it's kind of ideal in sense that people are getting um, new and new devices, they're spending money and uh, industry is develops further and so on. Uh, and it was working this more low for 30 years or something, but now already they have troubles. It's, it's hard for them. So they could always make it faster progress, but they didn't do it because of economical reasons. Um, but uh, now it's really the hard for them to follow the a tendency. And the reason is price. It's simply getting too expensive. And therefore, people in all fields of physics and science are searching uh, what else we can do, how we can process the data better. And uh, the direction of spin electronics tells you that, okay, this is electronics and here we try carry information in the form of uh, charge of electron. So our uh, signal is this current, C stays for current, which is a sum of all electrons which have spin up and spin down. So we do not distinguish if there is any difference between electrons that spin up and down, we just send all of them and, uh, and spin information is lost. But we know already so, uh, that electron has spin and uh, Spintronic says that let us use this degree of freedom, additional degree of freedom to transport information. 
And then principally spintronics is spin electronics. So the idea is to combine pure electronics, ideally the same fancy semiconductor technique, but to add something on top, to add some uh, features which are not, uh, some possibilities which are not accessible to electronics on its own. And uh, uh, nevertheless, if to speak about pure spintronics without electronics, then what we are dealing with, we are dealing with so-called spin car. So imagine that you have situation when electrons will spin up, all moving to the left, and uh, electrons will spin down, moving to the right. And then you are searching for spin current or spin polarized current, S stays for spin, as a difference between spin up and spin down. So here in this case, if you will have this current, as many electrons go to one direction, so many electrons flow to run to another direction. So current is equal to zero in this case. But spin current, which is a difference in spin polarization, is not zero. It's maximal here, this fact. And vice versa. If you will analyze yeah, uh, this situation, yeah, so JC is equal to zero, and JS is maximal. And here JS is zero and JC is maximal. So these are two limited cases and uh, people principally uh, kind of, you can use both of them. And usually we're speaking about spin polarization, which is a value which gives you how many, um, uh, what is the difference in density between spin up and spin down electrons. So, what other advantages are given? So spin, it carries, um, it has associated magnetic material. So it means that you have now a good influence, a good selection of new physics, which you can use to process data. Uh, for example, uh, you can use, manipulate uh, your spin by polarized light, or you can manipulate it by applied magnetic field or by strain, or there are many, many different. So everything what we were discussing, magnetism now can be used on purpose for processing data. Um, yeah, so it gives you on its own uh, additional degree of freedom. And the spin interference, the spin information seem to be more stable than charge. And this is very important, uh, more stable against uh, perturbations. And in this sense, it's of interest for quantum uh, data processing. So it makes sense to do quantum data processing with spin. And um, yeah, and then you can have control of magnetization, control magnetization currents, and control yeah, to process and to transfer information. So principally now you mix everything, all possibilities to, of manipulation, you can use spintronics to process information and to transfer information depending on the a particular task you have. So what are the main applications in spintronics? The main applications as we discussed is hard disk drive. So we talked that now information stored on clouds use hard disk drive. In our laptops we use it not so often. Now SSD technology which is solid state drive which is pure semiconductor technology pushes out hard disk but not from uh, clouds. Clouds are using each, uh, hard disk because of price and because of endurability. And here the reading hat uh, is based on GMR or TMR, which we'll discuss later. Sensors, so there are many sensors. Again, in the uh, first lecture we discussed that Auto has many tens of different sensors. And many of them are based on GMR, giant magnetic resistance and they measure everything what is needed in order to measure to be sure that car is moving properly. Uh, magnetic random access memory, one of the important topics of this lecture we will discuss. So it's um, uh, such a, a memory like SRAM uh, we have, but uh, mm, with the possibility to store information. So this is what we name operational memory in our computer it's uh, very fast and it's always very important to have it. The problem is that when you switch off the power of your computer, uh, information is lost. And MRAM is kind of operational memory which will keep all the information in there. Uh, it's uh, commercially available. 
it's one of the hopes of Spintronics. Uh, still, I think their its properties not mm, comparable to, no, not yet competitive to uh, flash memory to SSD. And finally, there is such a portion spin field effect transistor. So it's interesting physics, uh, which we'll discuss, but probably it's not yet in use anywhere. Chris, am I right? Or you know that somebody is using spin field effect transistor? Uh, no, I don't think it's used at the, the large scale. It's mostly for the concept investigation. Yeah, I think it's still in the lab here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. So here there are different applications, different phenomena, but all this we will discuss during the course, so no need to go through it now. Uh -huh. Now just to get a, a break, there is a, a there is a, this video uh, about Spintronics, why it's useful. It's on a very basic level, is that you will get the main point. Just take it as a rest. Do you remember the first computer you ever used, or the TV you once watched cartoons on? It's easy to take modern technology for granted, but if you compare it to the room-sized computers of the 1960s, you'll notice how quickly things have changed, or rather, how much they've shrunk. As technology advances, the amount of data we need to store and manipulate is increasing, and the size of devices is decreasing so much that conventional techniques of data storage won't be good enough for long. Most modern technology is electronic, it uses a property of electrons called charge to encode information. One example is computer memory, often called RAM, which is where computers keep information they're working with for several seconds or minutes. RAM contains billions of tiny plates called capacitors that hold electrons. To store information, computers send a current of electrons into the capacitors. Some of these electrons collect on the plates. If the number of electrons on a capacitor is above a threshold, the computer assigns it a value of 1. Otherwise, it's a 0. Unique patterns of zeros and 1s encode information like letters, numbers, and images. As chips get smaller, so do capacitors, and we are faced with a problem of charge leakage. Electrons constantly slip away from the plates. When the electron count falls below the threshold, the stored data is lost. To avoid this, computers have to recharge their capacitors several times per second, which requires more and more power as chips shrink. Fortunately, an emerging technology called Spintronics could solve this problem. Spintronics uses spin, another property of electrons, to encode data. The spin of an electron is either up or down. It is helpful to think of spin-up electrons as little magnets with their north poles pointing up and spin down electrons with downwards pointing north poles. Data is stored based on the spin states of electrons that are already present. This means that there is no problem of leakage with spintronics. Once information is stored, it stays there until we want to change it. The spin states of electrons change if we actively influence them by exposing them to magnetic fields. To take advantage of this, scientists developed magnetoresistive RAM which replaces capacitors with tunneling magnetoresistive structures. TMR structures are made up of an insulator sandwiched between two ferromagnetic materials. An insulator is a material with very high resistivity. This means that electrons are very unlikely to move through it. A ferromagnet is a material in which the spins tend to align along the same direction. The lower ferromagnetic layer is fixed its electrons are forced to have the same spin as each other by an adjacent strong magnet. The upper ferromagnetic layer is free. Its electrons change their spins in response to external magnetic fields or through a phenomenon called spin transfer torque, which is where electrons change their spins to match the spins of nearby flowing electrons. When the spins of the ferromagnetic layers are parallel, the structure stores a one. Opposite spins represent a zero. To read the data and determine whether it's a zero or a one, the computer sends a tiny current through the TMR structure. If the spins of the top and bottom layers are parallel, electrons can tunnel through the insulator. Tunneling is a process that is similar to a basketball moving through a solid wall. It's normally very unlikely, but parallel spins make it possible. If the spins are opposite, almost no electrons tunnel through. 
By seeing how much current reaches the other side, a computer can tell whether the structure is holding a 1 or a 0. To write data, we send larger currents up or down the structure. Sending electrons up the structure from the fixed layer to the free layer switches the value from a 0 to a 1. Because of spin transfer torque, the flowing electrons adopt the fixed layer spin as they move through it. The electrons in the free layer then flip to match the spins of the flowing electrons. Since the free layer responds to changes in external magnetic fields, which are generated by both computers and living organisms, TMR structures have numerous applications beyond computers. When a neuron in your brain fires, your heart beats or a white blood cell attacks a virus. Tiny magnetic fields are created. A spintronic sensor chip could detect the smallest deviations from your normal magnetic fields, detecting anything from bacterial infections to brain tumors. Because magnetic fields are not altered by the structures they move through, it could even do this from outside the body. And because electron spin changes are near instant, spintronics technology could do so quickly. Ultimately, spintronics technology holds promise in countless areas, from computer memory to medicine and beyond. Okay, so that's it about introduction and motivation part of this lecture. And the next lecture, we will speak about basics of electric conductivity.